down to Biscay. Yay. Uh, five on the floor, ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing, you can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck the said, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor plan, got an all band. Y'all seen the block, stop with one hand. And Pat, we trust, it's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat, y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. Welcome back to Five on the Floor. I'm your host, Greg Sylvander. Tonight's floor plan with me, we have Alex Toledo. Follow him on Twitter at Tropical Blanket, and we have Brady Hawk. Follow him on Twitter at BradyHawk305. We are going to dive in uh, the night before... Uh, the day before game two on what the heat can do to adjust to what they saw from Denver in game one, get into what we expect to see. Uh, I have some thoughts on maybe where we should start. Uh, So we're going to just basically dive into what the heat can do differently between game one and game two and get into as many adjustments as we see fit before we do any of that though want to shout out one of our great sponsors here at the five reasons sports network. Do you have a water leak and can't find where it's coming from, or you're dealing with a water mold damage issue in your home or business? Y'all know who to call water cleanup of Florida at 954-579-0356 with over 60 years of combined experience. Michael Robert, their entire team is prepared to handle all types of leak detection issues, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. After the leak has been located and repaired, water cleanup of Florida will then clean, dry, and restore the the damaged area. Water Cleanup of Florida is fully licensed, certified, one-stop shop for all busy homeowners and business owners. Service areas include Miami, Broward, and Palm Beach County. Call Michael anytime on his personal cell, 954-579-0356. Again, that's 954-579-0356. Or visit the website. You're seeing it here on the screen, wcufl.com for our podcast listeners. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Again, that's wcufl.com. Water Cleanup of Florida. If you have the schmutz, they have the gut adjustments need to be constructed uh that is an old atmosphere lyric for my hip-hop heads out there so game two here we go y'all um i the more i watch so i watched a little bit of game one again particularly the second half um and the more i watch there's a part of me that's like damn that was the game to get because uh, i felt like they in the second half, particularly, uh, picked it up defensively, and and I don't know if it's going to be things that will be uh, duplicated game over game, but it seemed like they were heading in the right direction, and just they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from three, and that's just the way that goes. So now we look ahead to game two, and I want to start where I started our post game show, and that's Jimmy Butler, because we all know what he needs to do to get more aggressive. Like we can say what it is, but I want to ask. And I'm gonna, I guess I'm I'm gonna throw this softball at you, Brady. I don't know, maybe it's a fastball. If you were Eric Spolstra, is there something you could be doing? Because everyone's talking about Jimmy needs to be more aggressive. And yeah, okay. I think he actually acknowledged that verbally in the press conference after the game. We saw it uh with not getting to the line. That's not Jimmy Butler like. Is there anything Spolstra can do to activate Jimmy Butler in this game, particularly Brady? I, I'll say first, I honestly believe 99% of it is on Jimmy Butler just himself because I was even looking over, I posted some of the his shot profile in that game one, and it was like a lot of it was literally him just settling for those long twos and then just those jumpers over and over. Uh, and it's funny because it almost felt like the reason for it was that he just hasn't seen those looks in like a matter of weeks. Like he has not seen those pull up, that clean of a pull up jumper since the Walkie series. So he was like, Okay, I'm taking these shots. And yeah, it, we're not talking about this if he's hitting them, but obviously he wasn't. But either way, you have to get to the line, you have to get to the rim, and you have to open up all things, those things, and that's on him. And he even said after the game, I know we didn't touch on this, obviously, because the pressures were going on as we were doing the post-game show yesterday, but he was talking about, like, that is on nobody else but me. I have to kind of do that. And I know everybody was reacting and saying, well, how do you not realize that in the game? And you realize it after the game, but that's for a different conversation. Uh, He needs to do that. But then in terms of what Spo could do, uh, the main thing is like he doesn't have to just attack the rim out of a pick and roll. I think that's kind of where uh, they can mix things up, I guess. And I guess that's probably later in the series, maybe not a game two thing. 
But number one is I was talking about a couple of the actions that I thought looked best for Miami in game one. And one of them is something I've talked about for a while, even heading back to the Milwaukee series, is the high-low actions with Bam and Jimmy. Bam had like two or three assists to Jimmy on those type of plays. And it's mostly because, once again, they pulled their big man away from the rim and Jimmy can attack smaller matchups. And I guess the other flip, not even having to be a Bam playmaking, he just has to go mismatch hunting a little bit more. It felt like he was settling just for that jumper once again, like over and over just because he knew it was there. And even when he wasn't settling for the jumper, he was settling for the pass. And I know that's the big thing is like he cannot be passive. He, not, he cannot just only be worried about everybody else. Uh, but if he can just get that Jamal Murray switch, get that Caldwell Pope switch, get one of those type of things, try to get Aaron Gordon off of him and then create from there. And if, hey, if he's on the low box, if he's in the mid post and he's on Jamal Murray on his back and now he has Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon doubling over and that's when he's making the pass, that is completely fine. Like you want those shots and you want those plays and you'll live with that result. But you cannot be, I guess, spamming a pick and roll and just kicking out over and over. And, and it's just there's no nothing new happening there. So it, I, to answer your question, I really do think it's about Jimmy coming out and, and just attacking. And it seems like he knows that. And that's why I'm honestly not worried about the Jimmy aspect of this. Like when you talk about your, your concern level on different things without that from that game one. Jimmy Butler, honestly, is very low on my concern meter because I know that he can turn it up. And it's specifically, if this is not Boston anymore, I'm like, can he f- figure it out, get to his spots? He's going to get to his spots. And if it, it comes down to him ma- just making shots, uh, I'm going to bet on Jimmy Butler. So that that's the one aspect of it that I guess I'm not too concerned about. So I like where you're going with concern meter. We're going to circle back to that in a moment. And I'm going to pick both of your brains on what you are actually concerned about. But the other thing I didn't like about game one um Alex was I mean it's the the low hanging fruit is to say the shooting from Max and Caleb but I want to focus more on the attempts from Caleb Martin like when I went back and looked at the box score again this morning I'm like yo seven like um seven field goal attempts and then I went and looked throughout the postseason he's getting almost 13 field goal attempts a game so that was a weird thing that that happened in game one What's your take on what how Caleb can adjust to this series? Because he was such a big part of what they did against Boston. He was kind of like the the neutralizing factor all of a sudden, although Brady keeps mentioning, and I agree with him, he can't be the X factor again and again and again. But now he kind of needs to pick himself off the mat. So I'm interested, Caleb Martin. I guess also Max Struess uh, has a lot to work on there, but I think we all kind of know where that might be heading. Um, so what do you think about Caleb? And then we're going to go to concern meter. I like that from Brady. Well, the Caleb thing is interesting because I think uh, he mentioned last night after the game that he did feel them kind of guard guard him a little bit differently. Whereas the Celtics, as we know, um, especially in the beginning of the series, he was kind of the guy that they weren't necessarily too worried about. And he really thrives off of playing in those types of situations. He knows that he can get to his shot. He knows that he can get to the rim, uh, uh, you know, off the catch. We've talked about this plenty of times, and I feel like the Nuggets are just kind of respecting him a little bit more. And, look, I was just talking – this is more of a general thing. With Like, I was talking with Brady before the show, and just one of the things that you see from the Nuggets, just it not only last night but in this playoff run, is even if their defense is not overall as good as Milwaukee's and Boston's just by kind of pr- personnel – they're what they do is they throw out a lot of different stuff at you. And I think like we also said before the show, Malone is probably the best coach they've gone against in this playoff run. And he really impressed me what they did last night. Like the nuggets are an offensive um, juggernaut. And I I just think they're kind of masterful what they do, the way that they diagnose what you're doing um, defensively with the schemes. And not only that, what matchups you have out there, you know, um, kind of what are your reactions going to be to certain things and they just it's it's a quick diagnosis and run the action and it sounds very simplistic but i I just think they're so impressive in that way like they're well who'd you compare them to pre-show though i think you should say this for the audience like i think it's a good analogy another pre-show thing uh we should have just been recording that but it's um they remind me in some ways of like a blend of what and I know this comparison has been made plenty of times already by others, but what the Spurs offered um, as a challenge to the Heat, as a you know, with just crisp and masterful ball movement, knowing what they want to get to, and just great execution. And then also um, the Mavericks, specifically the 2011 Mavericks, and just what that version of the team looked like, and kind of the way that they were built. 
top to bottom with just a really um very nice rotation when you look back at it like a lot of very you know pretty good players even if they weren't top heavy it's there's some similarities there that i, I feel like it's kind of like a blend you know people have compared Jokic in you know recently to dirk to dirk yeah now he he got some tim duncan comparisons on the uh, nba final finals media day and he's kind of said at this point that he's patterned his game after like eight guys so i don't know who he means it about or not but um anyways i, I think just watching them in that game, it's like, oh, yeah, you get a taste of why they're so damn good at what they do. They didn't even kill you from three at all, and it felt like they just had their way with you, right? Like, just the same way we're saying, you know, we made, you know, if you're thinking as, as a Heat player, we make more of our threes, it's yeah. a different game. Michael Porter, and, Michael Porter Jr. is thinking that same thing. Sorry. I mean, uh, right they no, no, I I had to interrupt myself to mute and cough again, uh, another pattern. But really, Michael Porter Jr., they dodged several bullets with him. I know I mentioned that last night. But just, excuse me, in general, offensively, it's crazy to see what they do. And on defense, I'm sorry, we com- I completely got away from the point. Um, Caleb is going to have to find creative ways to get to his shot here. They're not going to leave him wide open like Boston did. You were waxing poetic because I had kind of forgot that you were going veering off in another direction. I liked what you were saying there, so you should have kept rolling. Uh, Let's do a quick sponsor. I want to tell you about Mortgage by Arash. Mortgagebyarash.com is where you need to go. You can reach out to him for great service. Quick closings, competitive rates, down payment options as low as 3%. This is for all your mortgage needs. Credit scores starting at 620, fast closings, less than 20 days on them closings. First time home buyer programs available, borrow assistance programs available to help with down payment and closing costs. Again, where you need to go, he's a huge Heat fan, Mortgage by Arash, A-R-A-S-H.com, and 954-651-2057 is the phone number, mortgagebyarash.com, 954-651-2057. Mention Five Reasons Sports, he'll take great care of you, big Heat fan, enjoying the finals with us. So, concern meter, Brady Hawk. What are you most concerned about in this series after game one? I think it's about still, and I know we talked about this a lot on last night's post game show, so I don't want to fully echo everything we were saying, but it's still about dealing with the, the two man game. That's pretty much the, probably the deadliest two man game in the NBA right now, just because we were talking another thing pre-show we were mentioning is like, there's just not really an answer. Like you can't come on here and say, well, you have to do this, this, and this. It's like, no, you have to do everything because you have to see just what works at any given time. Like on paper, the zone makes zero sense, but then they mixed in some zone in the second half and it did a little bit of stuff. So it's like, you have to get weird. Like you just have to get weird from possession to possession basis. Uh, So that would probably be my biggest concern to answer your question is just dealing with those two, because we were also mentioning the fact that like they usually have something they can attack defensively. They're like, okay, we're going to help off this guy, or we're going to double this guy, or we're going to deal with this pick and roll this way. They don't really have that right now. This is like something, it's just a bunch of randomness Spo has to deal with. And that's why it's actually a fun basketball type of watch because it's, it's a bunch of just basketball minds going at it. Like Jokic is just out here dicing up a defense and Spo having to try to figure it out. It's just a cool thing to see in terms of adjustments within that though. Uh, defensively, there was a couple of things that we were talking about last night. When I rewatched some of the stuff, I was actually it, it changed some of the things I talked about because I was like, I felt like the Denver was obviously doing a really good job offensively, and Miami was mixing things up. But there was a lot of miscommunications from Miami that I didn't even notice, and I was like, that's going to be a big adjustment because they they was met like multiple times where they didn't know the coverage they were in, like whether it was somebody where they bam and, and a guard thought it was going to be a late switch or they thought it was drop or they thought he was going to play higher to the screen. Like it was always something. And that was a lot of the reasons I, I saw Jamal Murray getting free kind of at certain points in the game. Uh, so they have to figure that stuff out. And even early in the game, like I, I remember I said to myself in that game, I was like, how did Jamal Murray get the, get up to 18 points on this bunch of fish? So I was like, I, I, yeah, I have to like think back and go back to that. And it was like literally off ball stuff, just getting free, like them not wanting to budge on this on the switches or anything. So like there, there's so many things I felt like they could have really fixed up, I guess, heading into the next one. Uh, and then the, I guess the one positive thing that I saw that you could take away from them defensively 
is I would put Haywood Highsmith on Jamal Murray as much as possible. Like I, I really feel like that was their best answer for that two man game and Jamal Murray specifically, just because he has the wingspan. If he wants to go under, he has the wingspan and the recovery speed to kind of get out to a contest. If he's going to go over and chase you, he he's really good at just staying attached to your hip. And then the third thing is they can be creative with him in a way that they can't with anybody else, which is if they randomly want to throw in his random switch and say, we're going to throw Bam out on Jamal Murray and we're going to throw High Smith on Jokic. Well, yeah, it sounds crazy. But if he's fronting and now they're sending help from somewhere else and now you're at six seconds on the shot clock, it's not a bad idea. So like, Highsmith on Jamal Murray feels like an opening that opens up a lot of doors for them defensively. So that's the one thing I, I saw that was a positive. Uh, but just as much as I say that, just because their Denver offense looked good at times, they're going to adjust too and find different gaps that they saw that they like. So just because there's certain things that we're talking about here, uh, they're going to go to as well. So it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that. But as much as we talk about the pick and roll, the last thing I'll mention is I talked about the high-low actions from, from Bam and Jimmy. That's where Jokic thrives, and that's where they got so many of their easy buckets in that game and blew open the offense. So if they can kind of tame some of that, that'll help. And I know we kept saying, like, make Jokic a scorer. They they tried to do it in some ways. So it hard. Did, it did not work because it, it is. It's Bass just anyway. To do. So he'll just, he'll just dice it up in a different way or hold for an extra four seconds and then do it. So it's like, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what else they throw out there. But they, I think there's definitely some some openings that they can they can go about. But like you said as well, they had some good looks that they just missed as well. So we have to recognize that. Uh, but, hey, there, there's a part of basketball where there's there's luck involved. There's always that that conversation where luck's involved in this. So, hey, if they can – I don't know if they'll shoot 29% from three again, but if they could tame them enough, uh, they, they held them to 104 points. So that's another thing you could throw in the mix. So they just have to – the defensively is would be my highest concern to see what they mix in. I'm with you on all of that. And I really am glad that you mentioned the miscommunications because I didn't pick up on that. And um, uh, I I want to go back now. Now I'm interested to go see what you saw because um, I didn't pick up on that. So I'm glad you're mentioning it for our listeners. Alex, um, I now I'm looking at the box score again. And I was saying Caleb Martin's attempts didn't make sense to me, but he only played 24 minutes to that point. The guy Brady talked about, Haywood Highsmith, played 23 minutes. I do not see a situation where it's Haywood Highsmith playing, eating into Caleb's minutes. They need both of their asses out there. Lineup adjustments. Not that they're making adjustments to the starting lineup. I don't foresee that. If you disagree, please speak up. What do you think they're going to do in terms of the minutes distribution? Is that going to change at all? Is there any wrinkles? Because there's another thing Brady said, and I'm kind of coming to you with Brady's thoughts. He said, this has to get weird. So how does Spo make game two weird? I think that's a really interesting thing that I hadn't also thought about. So I'm going to give you the tough question of how does Spo make the, this game weird? And it's going to involve more Haywood Highsmith. So how does that happen? Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Um, I know we mentioned kind of some of the lineup stuff last night. And I mentioned a couple of times more high Smith and probably at the very least play love instead of Zeller. If you're not going to start him, which I understand if you don't want to, but I just want to see, first of all, what that part looks like. If you want to throw him on to Jokic, see if you can have Bam helping off again, just that's the type of different look that you can rationalize and try to make work. And, you know, you keep Bam off of Jokic for a little while. Um, you know, they were playing, Plenty of minutes last night um, with Jokic on the floor and no Bam. I mean, plenty relative to what you would expect, right? Because, you know, you could have the expectation of maybe you just they match Bam's minutes. Yeah. You match his minutes to Jokic and that's it. Like, you're in the finals, but that's not what they did. So, with that being the case, I would try it out. Because I don't think Zeller showed you anything last night. Like, you got to keep him there. Um, no hate towards him. Uh, I just think I want to see what that looks like. I don't think love is going to stop him by any means. Jokic is pretty fast, even for a, a big, a big guy like him. And I think he's going to be able to get his, have his way with love. But um, I want to see what Bam looks like more as a roamer sometimes. Uh, give me one second. If I could just cut in and say, by the way, I like the love idea just in terms of the fact offensively, he pulls Jokic out in a way that they didn't weren't able to do in that game one. It's a very so good point. you have to be able to move him around defensively and make him work. Yep. So at least it gives him a different look and, and force him to play up on the three-point line. Yeah, like you are not 
they were not making Jokic move around. <laughs> he was so all. deep like, in the lane. Oh we, my gosh. We know, yeah, I know. It's we we know that like Zeller is not a scoring threat off of any of those handoff actions. That he's not even a good finisher at the rim. No, when he does get there, like he tries his ass off. You know, he screens well. He moves pretty well for somebody that you think is like kind of slow and old. That's he's not old. He's he, I think he's only thirty years old. But that's just kind of like feels like he's been around forever. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I just think. Like Brady said there, and we mentioned this last night, you know, just make him move a little bit more and you just kind of take what love gives you on the defensive end. You try to work around it and see if it works. Like they got offense going throughout this playoff run from, you know, the Jimmy and Kevin Love lineups with no bam. Try to see if it works um, for stretches. Maybe you, you're zoning at that time with Highsmith and Gabe up top. I don't know. That's where the getting weird stuff happens. Definitely play more Highsmith. Maybe you play a little more Kyle. I'm not sure. Um I think the problem is, and Brady alluded to before, there just is no easy answer for their defense um, against the Nuggets offense. Like there is no, you know, I mentioned last night, you try to bring a third man into the 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 Murray Jokic actions. One more second. I'm sorry. And that, that might not be enough. Like I think it's, it's really the, what the Nuggets do that I think is the most problematic for the Heat is they make it really, really, really hard for you to help. And that's very problematic. Like yeah. they're they're so they're so creative with their sets and where guys are positioned and constantly moving guys around to places that are more advantageous for them. Um, it's like that big decide. man. That's crazy. And like Brady mentioned, like you could have Jokic up top, you could have him down low, you could have yeah. him at any point in the. I mean, on the court because he's he is a threat to score from absolutely everywhere. Even though that's not what he wants to do. First and foremost, you can't ignore him because the guy. It's a pure bucket. Like it's infuriating trying to guard this man. He might be the single most problematic, like individual to guard in the league because of everything he offers with his size, skill, you know, the 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 just the understanding of the court is insane. Like the guy is is an insane talent, insane player, and there's no easy answer. Like I think you, you know, we talked about the rigid the rigidity. I'm not even sure if that's a word of the heat's defense or maybe uh, like the the potential rigidity of the heat's defense for a a series like this where it makes it so hard to help off guys it's even harder than i thought just kind of visualizing it like they just move around so much and they move with a purpose they're not just moving to move it's like no margin for error yeah there's no margin for error i don't know how you switch on or off ball versus these guys i don't know how you help versus these guys other than again off gordon or brown but that's easier said than done because it like, um, you know, if only one guy is allowed to help, that's a lot of pressure on that one guy to get there. It's just not at all the type of situation the heat have had to go up against. Right. Where like the Celtics have not, you know, they didn't, they did not make it hard for you to help. Like they had guys who you could help off with. Like, you know, they killed you a couple of times, but Jokic and Murray just move and the ball and understand the game so much better. Like it's not even close. You know, yeah. Jokic diced you up as a passer last night, but so did Murray. And you know, he made a lot of tough shots. That's what he does. You know, sometimes some of those shots, it's like, what are you gonna do? Right? Like He's you defended good. it pretty damn well. But I think now the heat, you know, going into um the next game with film on all the different ways they got beat. Um, a lot of those off ball switches that happened early to get pretty anybody not named Jimmy. Guarding Aaron Gordon probably is not going to happen. Um, I, I'm interested to see how they guard the the Murray Jokic stuff, and then from there, I'm not sure what they do. Like, are you just going to say don't switch anything? We're just we're gonna we're we're gonna lock and trail off ball. Um, I mean, I don't know what the answer is. Like, it's I, almost like you have to have different rules for every single moment, and like that exactly. And that's it, what the Nuggets were doing. That's Correct. What they were doing so you just they were like dropping against certain guys, and then uh, like Caleb and Jimmy, switch. they were they were uh, dropping on Caleb, Jimmy, and they even dropped on Lowry and Vincent, and then like um, they came up higher for uh, on the Heat shooters, specifically Max and Duncan, and then and then even then like they would do that for most of the night, and then switch it up, like they they're constantly throwing different stuff at you, like they're a much more sophisticated defense than I think people including me give them credit for well and also they're much better prepared than any team that the heat saw throughout the eastern conference that i can absolutely tell just by one game just by a couple conversations listening 
<clears throat> to, um, excuse me, Michael Malone, um, talk to the reporters there at the, at the finals. I, he almost articulates himself so well. I'm like, yo, why are you, why are you giving him all this content? Like scale it back. You know, Spo tries to get out of those so quickly. Uh, one more sponsor before we end, uh, the show here and that's prize picks. Y'all know the daily fantasy sponsor of the five reason sports network. You're going to use the code five F I V E. That's how you get your initial deposit matched up to a hundred dollars. It's daily fantasy simplified prize picks. You choose your favorite players from your favorite sports, choose the stats that make sense to you. You choose more or less if they're going to go over or under the statistics, whether it's points, rebounds, assists, receiving yards, rushing yards, passing yards. As we get back into football or strikeouts in baseball, you can do flex plays, power plays. You got to use the code five to get that initial deposit matched up to a hundred dollars. Prizepicks.com or download the app. Use the code five. All right. As we close here, Brady, so that we end this on a high note, uh, the biggest positive you took from game one and how do you think it can translate heading into game two? It's funny that you bring that up because I was actually going to throw in the fact that as much as we talk about adjustments, we should also bring up the thing that was the the bright light, which was Bam. Like, I, I feel like what can he do differently or the same, I feel like, is the question. Is he going to see the same looks? And it feels like they're going to give him the shots that he had. Uh, and I feel like there's this idea that was like they just kind of sat back and just let him get these open jumpers. And that was not the case, really. Hell like no. His jumpers and his shots were tough shots that he was hitting. Like they, that's what was the funny thing. It was not like the these things from uh, a couple of years ago where they were just sitting back and making him take those shots. That is not the case. He was taking. He had a tough bank shot. He had tough little turnaround hook shots. Like he was doing things. He was just aggressive, which is what you need from your other <laughs> star player on this team. Which is what it's funny. It's usually the opposite way, but obviously, that's the main idea here is that i think the one sad part about that game one was people were like you wasted the big time bam offensive punch but it's like he may have it in him again with the way that he was looking confident against this defense it looked like he was getting to his spots with ease and the other thing i'll mention in terms of a positive was the one like offensive action that they went to that i thought looked better than anything was the high pick and roll stuff like when they went into high pick and roll we were talking about like how denver has principles for everything and they have to figure things out they can only do so much against a high pick and roll because you can't send help all the way up in the to a couple feet inside a half court. So it's like all it's like Jokic is on an island and you're just reacting to him. You don't have to react to the help being sent on your right or your left. You just literally have to look at that guy. Uh, so it was interesting because you look at the the end of the third quarter, early fourth quarter, where Kyle hits like three threes. He hits it like all in a row around that range. He just kept going high pick and roll into a pull-up, high pick and roll into a pull-up. And it was like, those looks are going to be there. So we could talk about them hitting their open spot-ups or their op or open threes in general, but those open pull-ups will be there. And I think that ties into, I know we haven't hit it on this, but the, obviously there was some speculation about Tyler returning in game two, possibly. Tyler Hero is going to love those shots. I don't, I, we, we're going to talk about the hand. We're going to talk about anything that, that, you know, spot minutes or anything along those lines. But all I'll say is that their guards love those type of shots. It's just Tyler, Gabe, Kyle are going to have those sitting there. So I think that's a positive for their offense that if even if things go south for like if Bam or Jimmy is kind of in a in a rut and can't get to their spots at a certain time or as their shots aren't falling, they have that as an avenue. So uh, it'll be interesting to monitor because I I really I said this before the series and I say it confidently after watching this game. It's like I really believe they can get to their shots comfortably. Like I watched that game and I'm like, I'm not worried about their offense, even with the ways that they mix things up. It's like, I feel confident with the, with the things they can get to, because it's not just one thing. They can get to a lot of different things, with a lot of different guys. So and I, quick, quick Tyler hero update. Uh, Cause Brady mentioned it. I'm going to go out on the limb and say, I expect him to be active, but that's not based off any updated Intel. It's been a very quiet day. There was no media, no shoot around, nothing uh, with the team today. So uh, I, will respect that rest period. And then I'll start asking questions again, manana. Um, Alex, final thoughts, uh, positive things you saw that may translate looking forward or just generally any, anything before we close here. So the positive thing, I know I mentioned this last night that, you know, they won the possession battle by a lot as far as, you know, getting up a lot more field goal attempts. So that's one good thing. That's a, just like a silver lining thing. But as far as our offense, like you can, there's a big case to be made that, there's a lot of offensive upside here to, to Brady's point, you know, for the heat. Like it is um, I, I would not be surprised at all if Jimmy comes out next game firing from the first quarter. I think 
especially like if they go through the film and see there was so many times that he had a shot available to him and just pass it up even the jumpers and and i agree with brady that he he was settling last night but even like there was some jumpers that he passed up too but most importantly getting to the rim um just plenty of times where i felt like he kind of you know you have these windows of time and he just passes them up and i feel like he's usually so good at that at just being opportunistic and taking advantage of those small windows just because he has such a high basketball iq and he you know he he's great at what he does and i didn't see that last night like i felt like i i that part of his game was completely absent last night it's like he, he just said i'm gonna try to win this game with straight jumpers and being a playmaker and doing what i do on defense you know but the rim stuff and getting to the free throw line it's just so important like he's not jimmy butler without that i appreciate everything else he does but that's what makes him special is how he can get his, you know get his way going to the rim finishing over guys getting to the free throw line even though he's not like way faster than dudes he's a lot stronger he's got to take advantage of it they were switching so many things off ball um that didn't have to do with Jokic and on ball and i just think like how many times have we seen jimmy take advantage of matchups before with those types of things just give him a guard screen or like brady mentioned before the series get him going as as the screener um with lowry or somebody or gabe handling something like that i, I just think um those types of things are going to be there and so like a lot most of the onus is going to be on jimmy but then the offensive upside also is going to come with the open looks that they missed um, on top of that, um, they didn't shoot that well at all in the mid range. I think it was 31% or something like that. The heat did like that's though. So there's a lot, a lot of offensive upside here. That's kind of the positive thing. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but I'm just, you know, just from what happened last night, you, you can get a lot more. So to me, the, the concern meter is on defense because if the heat, and this is what I was saying pre-show and, and bear with me here, cause I might lose my breath again and have to cough, but. Um, if the Heat don't have a team figured out on defense, sort of, right? Like where you have a, a a game plan to contain them that works and you feel good about, it might be GG's. It might be good game, especially if Jimmy Butler is not playing it. I, I mean, not playing like Jimmy Butler. Like it, though, you they are our defense first team, defense first organization, and I still believe that that's the case. Their offense is turned around in the playoffs, but I don't believe that they can play off their offense only and like i said they have plenty of upside for next game there's a lot of and i agree with brady they, they're going to be able to get to whatever sets they like the the nuggets like i said they 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 throw in a lot of different looks at you so it's not like it they're they're predictable and that's where the challenge is but they've gone through tougher stuff on that end of the floor i just think defending them is so so hard like i said before i don't know what the answers are and and i believe i trust Spo. There's just only so much you can do with the way the roster is built. And you got to be really, I think, strict with not switching a lot of these matchups. And so maybe it makes them a little bit more rigid. And, you know, hard. like I said before, they make it extremely hard for you to help. And that's what they want to do. So mm -hmm. I, I'm interested to see what the answers are going to be. I definitely don't have them. I absolutely don't. I'm not going to sit over here and act like I do. Um, but this might be the toughest challenge yet for Spo and these guys. And I think that's an interesting angle <clears throat> that we hadn't thought about. Like, is this Eric Spolster's toughest test as a head coach? Because I will say this, I think as we close here, Denver looked like they're the better and more prepared team in game one, but they've obviously been chilling for 10 days and the Heat have had to turn around from a really emotional roller coaster of game six and seven and finishing that. So I expect Spolster will have the group better prepared to everyone's point, watching film, seeing what could be improved upon. And then we talk about getting weird and this series needing to have something that kind of just mucks things up. If you're telling me that it's Jimmy Butler and Eric Spolstra that have the, uh, the um, emphasis in terms of who needs to step up and bring like their biggest adjustments in the next game, who better to trust than Eric Spolstra and Jimmy Butler. So hopefully we get another BAM game, better shooting, Spo and Jimmy at the top of the oh, you know what? One more thing, Leif. I'm sorry, I completely forgot to say this before. Like th three quarters, the Heat shot 35% from the field, 26% from three. And at that point, the Nuggets were, I believe, 55% from the field and 42% from three, even though they, they hadn't made that many threes. But that is unacceptable. 
right? To the whole yeah. point of like defense first identity. Like you have not only getting off to a good start, but just through three quarters, they're completely in control and are just not facing that much resistance, just all the easy ones at the rim. That is not heat basketball. That is yeah. not since Pat Riley has been here, right? That's not heat basketball is letting you get easy stuff. And they just got way too many easy things, specifically in that first half. Third quarter wasn't too bad. And we know that the fourth quarter is when the Heat kind of made their runs. But man, like that is not Heat basketball. And you're right. The heat, the, it's it's on the onus. I mean, the onus, excuse me, I can't even talk right now. The onus is on the Heat to figure that challenge out because the offensive upside is there and they're going to make more shots. Undoubtedly, Jimmy's going to come out and be more aggressive. I expect these things. But man, how are you going to defend this team? How are you going to let them? you know, I mean, keep them from getting to their game like that at home. It's the, no easy answer. Back to that again. No, it's, a, it's true, and that's how we're going to end the show. But I will say that um, as they're getting to their game, you're right. And I think that that's where right from jump they got to get into something that kind of just is uh, a different look. And so I'm hoping to see some creative stuff to start the game uh, as we look ahead to Sunday. I think that it's a big test, but they've gotten splits on the road before to start series. They did it in Oklahoma City in, in 2011. Uh, every time they win a game one, it doesn't go very well in the finals. And when they lose game ones in the finals, um, they've won a few of them. So uh, there's lots to look up uh, to from an upside perspective. I agree with everyone in terms of uh, that there's a lot of unsolvable things here, but that's where the things happen that we don't expect. So we'll see what happens in game two. I want to shout out our sponsors one more time. Prize picks, use the code five, mortgagebuyarash.com, water cleanup of Florida. We will have you covered tomorrow and leading up to game two on Sunday. Uh, back with another show. And then Ethan will have a guest coming up Sunday before we tip off at eight o'clock Eastern for game two. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.